just some instruction before starting the webinar, which is um, with a specific format today. Uh, so please stay muted for all the webinar um, section, just because we are going to have uh, more a roundtable format. So we will have a presentation um, from Jasha Karazek first for half an hour, and then we will have a discussion between three different winemakers of three different states. Uh, and we'll have discussion between all of us. So this is going to be easier if you can stay muted unless you have a question. And for the question, you can either unmute yourself or type your question either in the chat box or the Q&A box that you should have somewhere in your screen. So if you see three dots, click on those three dots and you should have access to the Q&A or the chat box. Um, so the webinar are uh, recorded, and so they are available on the YouTube channel of the Midwest Grape and Wine Industry Institute. And I will provide you the link uh, to have access to those recordings uh, during the, the webinar. And at the end, I will ask you to complete the survey to get some feedback from you. So today, it's our great pleasure to have Mr. Jasha Karazek. Uh, who will present the challenges related to making and bottling sweet wines. He will talk for about half an hour, as I said earlier. And after his presentation, we will have an open discussion for 60 minutes um, with three winemakers. So John Taylor from Shankaska Winery in Minnesota, Ryan Fridwitz, I hope I'm not <laughs> saying wrong your last name, uh, from Vines and Rushes Winery in Wisconsin, and Zach Bott from Fireside and Ackermine Winery from Iowa. So thank you very much to all of you for accepting uh, to participate in this webinar. And so, Jasha, I'm going to introduce you while you're sharing your screen, if you can. Um, so Jasha Krasek currently works in the technical department for NRTS USA at their lead winemaking specialist, a graduate um, analog of analogy and viticulture from the University of California, Davis, Joshua utilizes his production and lab experience to host educational webinars on topics such as wine stabilization, sensory improvement, and product application. His work in the wine industry focuses on analysis and winemaking techniques for quality improvement. So today, Jasha is gonna, going to present an overview of the challenges with sweet wine production. Thanks, Jasha. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Bru, for having me here today to present. Hello, everybody. Um, so my presentation today is Bottling Challenges with Sweet Wines. Um, so my presentation is really focused on sweet wines specifically and some of the challenges that might come with, uh, with bottling those wines. So the general overview, uh, we'll first talk about sweet wine uh, production challenges. We'll talk about the use of sorbate. Uh, sorbate is used uh, very commonly in, uh, in sweet wines, especially at bottling. Uh, the synergies of sulfite and sorbate. We'll talk about filtration, and then finally, analysis recommendations for bottling sweet wines. So some of the challenges that come with uh, sweet wines and bottling is microbial spoilage. Um, so more sugar, more problems, basically, when, you come, when it comes to bottling. Um, microbes are always looking for energy sources uh, to survive and proliferate. Uh, sugars are some of the easiest uh, sources for microbes to be able to utilize. Uh, so having sugar available post-bottling uh, or in wine in general, it's basically giving a source of energy, easy source of energy to microbes for them to be able to take in, use, and proliferate. Uh, so it's not only used by regular wine yeast, though. We have other mi uh, microorganisms in wine that can use sugar uh, and can proliferate uh, in wine with that sugar. So having sugar available just creates a little bit more difficulty uh, in these wines. So just as a general overview of the more common sources of spoilage as far as wine microorganisms, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is our common uh, fermentation yeast in winemaking, 
Uh, while it's not normally thought of as a spoilage microorganism, it actually can be a spoilage microorganism if it's in the context of a wine that you do not want to ferment. Uh, so Saccharomyces, while it does our primary fermentation, is very important for winemaking, can be a spoilage microorganism in some contexts. Britannomyces is a common uh, spoilage microorganism that we see all throughout the winemaking process, either fermentation, through aging, and through bottling as well. So uh, that's that's a really important one to be able to control, uh, and that's going to be an important factor to consider when we're talking about sorbate. Pichia or uh, film yeast is not commonly uh, too much of an issue in, um, in, in bottling of sweet wines because it typically proliferates in the presence of oxygen, uh, but it can be a, a problem if we are, uh, let's say, cellaring a, a sweet wine. Zygosaccharomyces, this is going to be problematic when we start to talk about concentrates and the use of concentrates and back sweetening, uh, as it can be a potential uh, contaminant in, um, in concentrates if we are back sweetening our wines before. Uh, bottling with concentrates. Enococcus ini, uh, while this is a really useful uh, lactic acid bacteria for conducting the uh, malolactic conversion, it can also be a spoilage microorganism if you have sugar present. Lactobacillus, um, lactobacillus is bad in pretty much any situation in wine, in my opinion. You really want to keep lactobacillus to a minimum in your, um, in your winery. And then acetic acid bacteria, uh, this is usually more of an issue during aging. Um, in the presence of oxygen, you see the gas and bacteria will produce uh, VA or volatile acidity, um, it, but it can be a problem post modeling as well. So we have a, a, a plethora of different microorganisms, microorganisms that we find commonly in wine that can create problems, and in particular in sweet wines as well. So what are the risks that we have with um, bottling a sweet wine? Well, re-fermentation is certainly one of the uh, larger risks that we can have. Um, oftentimes, we are bottling uh, sweet wines in bottles that are not meant to hold lots of pressure. Uh, so if we have a re-fermentation that happens in the bottle, that sugar basically gets converted into CO2, and that CO2 can cause problems as far as uh, exploding glass bottles. So. This is obviously not the situation that you want, where you have a bottle of sweet wine, you have some re-fermentation in the bottle. Um, let's say a customer's already purchased the bottle, it's in their uh, cellar or in their, their home, and then you have some uh, either explosive glass or some leaking or some re-fermentation happening. It's not a great uh, thing to happen. So obviously re-fermentation is, is a huge risk. Off flavors and aromas can happen in this situation as well. Uh, so it's not just the pressure issue. It's also you can have development of um, of uh, high VA or issues with other flavor problems. And then the last thing that you want is a a dry sweet wine uh, that is fritzy. So that this is about the intentionality of your wine making. And if you're bottling a wine that you feel like is in a good place as far as its sweetness. And it's going to uh, meet your criteria as far as what kind of wine you want. The last thing you want is for that wine to change into a dry wine that now has spritz. And if we have a, a red wine, for instance, it's just not a commonly seen uh, sort of wine and, and probably wouldn't be well appreciated in, in many instances. So, um, not that I haven't seen dry spritzy wines before. In some areas of Italy, they're quite common, but in the context of trying to have intention with your winemaking, this is obviously not a good situation. So preventing re-fermentation, how can we avoid re-fermentation? The best thing that we can do is maintain proper sanitation, uh, not only in the wineries, but also in our bobbing lines and our hoses and our bottles, basically anywhere that the wine is going to touch in the process of getting it from the cellar into the bottle it needs to be as clean as possible uh, and sure to ensure that you don't have contamination. Bobbing lines are probably the biggest critical control point for, uh, for sweet wines. Uh, and that we want to make sure that all of the uh, all of the spigots, all of the um, areas that the wine is touching, is completely devoid of bacteria or yeast, uh, and is sanitary, so that when we are bottling, we haven't uh, contaminated the wine before it goes into bottle. We can do things like sterile filtration, um, but if we are contaminating the wine at some point in the bottling line, or in the hose going in the bottling line, or something like that, then we're, we uh, basically are spinning our wheels as far as um, preventing a re-fermentation from happening. So sterile filtration is going to be your best friend as far as um, preventing re-fermentation. So sterile filtration is usually down to 0.45 microns porosity size. 
that's going to exclude a majority of the yeast and bacteria that could create problems uh, post bottling. Um, there has been some studies that show that there's some bacteria that can make through a uh, 0.45 serial filter. But for the most part, if you are going through a 0.45 serial filter, you're, you're, you're doing pretty good as far as your prevention of, um, of bacteria and yeast from making their way into the bottle. Filtering, uh, I don't know if this is commonly used in, um, in Minnesota or in Iowa, but this could be uh, something that is useful for winemakers. You know, depending on the size of the winery or the batch, uh, you could possibly use this. Uh, I know a lot of uh, winemakers are using it at larger wineries. Some small wineries might have access to it. And generally, uh, it comes down to whether your region has uh, service of Bell Friends, which is a company that provides the service. Um, if you don't have it in your region, you can always reach out to providers and ask them to, uh, to start service in your area as well. Sorbet. Um, can be used as a safety net. I say safety net because I want to caution the use of sorbate and in, in the context that it uh, it can help protect uh, a sweet wine from refermentation. Um, but it's not the end all be all, and, and so I still highly recommend taking as many measures as possible and using sorbate um, with you know with caution um, because there can be some problems if uh, if you have other contamination in the in the product. Uh, but sorbate can be a good uh, yeast inhibitor. Um, usually, uh, winemakers can use up to 300 milligrams per liter, which is the maximum legal dosage. Um, but you want to make sure that you have adequate molecular SO2 levels in your wines as well, uh, which I'll talk more about in a couple of minutes. But basically, um, you want to make sure that you have molecular SO2 that can protect against lactic acid bacteria contamination. As well as the sorbate, which can help uh, as a safety net for yeast uh, if there is any contamination in your bottling lines or things like that. So the obligatory discussion on molecular SO2. Um, here, I'll just quickly go over uh, the molecular SO2 in wine. It's important. So we have our pool of SO2 in wine. We have our total SO2, which is the combination of SO2 that is bound to things like aldehydes, sugars, um, anthocyanins, uh, so we have SO2 that's bound to things, and then we have the free SO2 component, which is SO2 that can basically react with other things in the wine. The free SO2 is broken down into three different sort of categories, and the, the distribution of SO2 in the wine uh, is going to be dependent on the pH. So at lower pH, we have a, um, we have a, a higher amount of this molecular SO2, which is this curve right here. Uh, at higher pH, we have this bisulfite uh, form, and then at very high pH, we have this sulfite form. We don't really see any of this sulfite form in wine because the pH in wine is typically between, let's say, 2.9 and 4.2, typically. Um, so at the lower pH, we have more of this molecular SO2. The molecular SO2 is going to be the one that's important in terms of uh, microbial um, prevention. So just to be sure that when you're looking at your SO2 levels, you also consider the uh, pH of your wine to ensure that you have adequate molecular SO2 in your wine. So um, now we'll talk about potassium sorbate. So I mentioned it uh, just a couple minutes ago. Potassium sorbate is a salt of potassium and sorbic acid. Sorbic acid is this sort of um, unsaturated fatty acid. And then potassium uh, acts as a, a salt to make it uh, dissolvable. So, sorbic acid is the antifungal agent. Uh, so, it uh, inhibits Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So, it inhibits it. It doesn't actually kill Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but it prevents it from growing and proliferating. So, you don't want to use it as a way of um, trying to completely kill the yeast in the wine, but it can help uh, prevent small populations from proliferating and becoming more abundant in the wine. Uh, so if you had a very high population of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, you wouldn't want to just throw sorbate at it to try and fix that. Uh, you want to make sure that you are working with smaller populations in general. So what sorbate does is it depletes energy in the microorganisms due to the accelerated proton pumping out of the cell. So it basically um, hijacks uh, the microorganism's ability to maintain its, um, its cell membrane. And then it inhibits spore development and uh, dehydrogenase enzymes. So basically shuts down, uh, shuts down the, the yeast. 
So the company that I work for, Anardis USA, uh, we have a product that we uh, created for this purpose, uh, which is a combination of sorbate, sulfite, and ascorbic acid. Uh, so the idea being stability um, on many different levels, sorbate acting as an inhibitor for yeast, the sulfite acting as an inhibitor for uh, bacteria, and then the ascorbic acid acting as a, um, an antioxidant agent. So uh, a little bit more on sorbate, the efficiency as an antimicrobial actually increases as pH decreases. So the lower your pH, the more efficient the sorbate is going to be at preventing refermentation. So that, that works to your benefit if you have lower pHs, but if you have higher pHs, then uh, you, may, you may need to consider um, the effectiveness of the sorbate for that reason. So the efficiency increases as the alcohol increases. So if you have higher alcohols, the efficiency of the sorbate is going to be better. Uh, it is synergistic with sulfite. So you do want to use sulfite when you're using sorbate. That's an important factor. And its effectiveness uh, basically is decreased with turbidity. So you want to use this in clear or clarified products because it's going to be less effective if you have uh, some cloudiness or turbidity. One of the main uh, concerns with using sorbate in sweet wines uh, to prevent re-fermentation is that um, you can get a, um, a taint from the conversion of the sorbate uh, by malolactic bacteria. Uh, so bacteria can basically convert, in the presence of ethanol, sorbate into this 2 ethoxy hexa 3 5 diene which is basically draining aroma. Uh, so this problem mostly emerged with the use of sorbate in the 70s uh, initially uh, and was discovered to be a result of uh, this conversion in the presence of ethanol with lactic acid bacteria. Uh, so that's why it's really important to have sulfite present when you are, um, when you are using sorbate because the sulfate, uh, the, the sulfite is going to really help with inhibiting any potential malolactic bacteria contamination. Um, while the sorbate can uh, continue to prevent re-fermentation from the yeast. So, some pros and cons on sorbate for yeast suppression. So, pros, it suppresses Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so that's a good thing. Uh, can act as a safety net for sweet wines. So, I say safety net because, again, we should probably be doing sterile filtration and man uh, maintaining the um, the wine as much as possible as far as, far as um, preventing contamination of the bottling lines and things like that. Um, and it can be added prior to bottling. Some of the cons, it does not suppress zygosaccharomyces. Uh, so zygosaccharomyces is a spoilage yeast that can be present in concentrate. Uh, so uh, some uh, concentrate companies have had a history of Zygosaccharomyces uh, contamination. I think that they've been actively working to prevent this from happening, uh, but I think it does pop up occasionally. So if you're using concentrate, it's important to um, consider uh, testing your wine post concentrate addition to make sure that you're not adding any of this into your wine. Um, but also, if you're using sterile filtration, uh, you should be able to remove any Zygosaccharomyces contamination. Uh, but just something to consider is that sorbate does not inhibit zygosaccharomyces. So if you have it present in your wine, uh, the zygosaccharomyces can use sugar and re-ferment, um, and it's not going to be inhibited by sorbate. Uh, so it can be metabolized by lactic acid bacteria, and sorbate has no impact on bacteria. It only impacts the uh, yeast, particularly saccharomyces. Does not kill saccharomyces cerevisiae. Does not work for bacteria, and it can cause some sensory changes. So it's also important to test how it impacts the sensory of your wine before adding it, uh, because while you're while you should be considering the amount of sorbate for microbial protection, you should also consider its impact on the sensory of the wine. Different people have different sensory thresholds for um, for sorbate, so it sometimes helps to have multiple people tasting this, just in case you don't have as high um, as low as a threshold as some people. So um, just a, just another thing to consider. Some other antimicrobial agents that can be used in wine, lysozyme, uh, can be used for elimination of gram-positive bacteria, such as lactic acid bacteria. Um, so it works well for lactic acid bacteria, but doesn't uh, work for gram-negative bacteria, such as acetobacter uh, or yeast. 
So this can be used um, as a means of eliminating the lactic acid bacteria, but it does have a deleterious impact on red and white phenolics and color oftentimes. So you can lose some uh, color and phenolics if you use it on red wines. Uh, and there's a possible allergen as well. So, uh, so why may they still use it? Uh, some of them are avoiding it because of the allergen situation and because it does have some impacts on the, um, on the sensory of the wine as far as the, the color of phenolics. Other things that can be used actively for uh, cellaring or as a pre-bottling treatment for, uh, for sweet wines is Kytosan. Um, so particularly we have a product called Stout Micro that we use um, that is basically like an antimicrobial fining agent. Uh, so what it does is basically uh, the Kytosan will bind to Britannomyces and other spoiled microorganisms um, and as the product settles out of the wine, you can remove those microorganisms with it. Uh, so it does kill lactic acid bacteria, Britannomyces, also helps with Zygosaccharomyces and Cetobacter a little bit. So while this is not something that should be used as a means of completely eliminating bacteria and yeast and avoid filtration and all those things, this is not used for that purpose. If you don't have a means of filtering your wine, um, or sterile filtering your wine, then this, this could be a benefit as far as helping lower populations before any sulfite or sorbate additions. But this is not intended to be used uh, as an alternative to sterile filtration uh, or sorbate uh, for that matter. Um, but it can help clean up the wine um, prior to, to bottling, or it could be used uh, during aging to prevent spoilage as well. Uh, so that's kind of the thing we're still like, though. Uh, so again, just kind of harping on the Zygosaccharomyces concern pre-bottling. Um, some concentrate can have Zygosaccharomyces, so just uh, maybe do some checks to see if you do have any potential contamination if you are using concentrate. Um, and it's not inhibited by sorbate again. Some recommendations that uh, you might do prior to bottling. So analysis is always a good thing to do prior to bottling and post-bottling. Um, and that's going to give you more information about your wine before you bottle. So you might make some changes and it might give you some information after uh, you bottled that could help sort of drive decision making for cellaring or for any concerns of re-fermentation. So pre-bottling, recommend doing PCR for bacteria and yeast. That'll help tell you, okay, do I have any potential contaminants in the wine and what are those contaminants? residual sugar levels. It's good to know what your residual sugar levels are because if you do have a contamination, you do want to be able to track the change in residual sugar over time because that'll tell you if fermentation is starting to kick off or if you're losing residual sugar for that reason. Uh, ethanol is important to know for one for the TTB, but also because of uh, sorbate and uh, its impact on, um, on sorbate effectiveness. Malic acid is a good thing to know because if you have a lactic acid bacteria contamination and you see a de uh, decrease in malic acid, then it could indicate that there's some uh, conversion happening. CO2 is good to know because some winemakers like to bottle with a little bit of extra CO2. Um, and if your CO2 is increasing, again, that could be another converse way of measuring whether or not there's a refermentation happening. Uh, and some CO2 could be useful for that purpose. SO2, obviously very important for the reasons mentioned before, uh, not only free SO2, but uh, knowing what your molecular SO2 is as well. If you start to see extreme decreases in your SO2 and you have some microbial uh, contamination, it could be a problem. SO2 also decreases with reaction to oxygen. So if you have a lot of oxygen pickup during bottling, a lot of DO pickup, your SO2 is going to drop over time uh, from that DO pickup. So it's good to know if you have good control over DO pickup at uh, bottling or if you don't. If you don't, then you might want to increase your SO2 a little bit so that you can maintain molecular SO2 without, um, with, with the loss of SO2 from its reaction with oxygen. So if you get oxygen at, at bottling and it reacts with the SO2 and the SO2 drops, you might lose some microbial protection. So sometimes it's good to know um, it's good to know before bottling how much your, your DO pickup is for that reason. And then bottling line sanitation is obviously super important. And one way that you can monitor the sanitation of your bottling line in real time is with ATP swabbing. So ATP swabbing is basically you have 
a, a little swab and a machine that you can use um, with the specific swabs. And what you do is if you have, uh, after, you've done, after you've done cleaning or steaming or basically just prior to uh, bottling, you can swab different areas of your winery, be it the bottling line or the hoses or whatever. Uh, and you can place it in this machine. The machine will tell you if there's ATP on the surface, which means that there's microbes present. Uh, so it's a good way of verifying whether or not you have achieved um, your goal of sanitation on your equipment or um, or, or wine equipment. So that's all pre-bottling uh, recommendations. Post-bottling recommendations: plating for yeast of bacteria or PCR post-bottling. It can be really useful information because if you have picked up any uh, potential bacteria or yeast post-bottling, that would be good to know ahead of time before you have a problem. Uh, dissolved oxygen is really important. This is usually done on site, but it can be sent off. And the problem is that if you do your dissolved oxygen uh, with a commercial lab and you've sent your wine off, then the dissolved oxygen may decrease over time. So it's usually better to have this done on site with a meter. Um, if you are doing plating for yeast and bacteria, it's good to do multiple uh, bottles depending on how many different spouts you have in your bottling system. So if you have four spouts, if you have six spouts, you'll want to pull one bottle from each spout if you're going to do the analysis because oftentimes what will happen is there will be, a, if there is a re-fermentation or contamination, it's coming from a specific spout um, on your bottling line. And so, because this is, a, this is usually a, an area of high contamination in, in bottling. Uh, and if it is coming from one specific spout, then it's good to know and basically isolate um, that there will be some bottles that are contaminated. Um, so, and if you if you are doing the analysis, you want to make sure that you want to submit one from each spout because that'll tell you basically if uh, if you if you have any contamination ahead of time. So, just some couple of extra tips on the analysis uh, perspective. So, I'll wrap up this uh, brief foray into bottling on sweet wines uh, with some conclusions. So sanitation and sterile filtration are the best way to prevent issues post bottling. SO2 and sorbate can work uh, synergistically to prevent re fermentation, but these should be safety nets. These should not be uh, your, um, you know, your your way of preventing re fermentation. Your your real um, protective measures are going to be with sterile filtration and sanitation. Um, sorbate is not a silver bullet and can still be metabolized by lactic acid bacteria and create that geranium taint issue. Uh, grape concentrate can be contaminated, so be cautious with its use. Uh, I'm not trying to point fingers at concentrate producers or anything like that, but I'm just saying if you are using it uh, pre bottling, uh, that it's good to do checks every once in a while. And then post bottling analysis can help to provide a peace of mind. So doing some analysis to see if you have any uh, bacteria or yeast present can help you, um, you know, sort of ease your mind about whether or not you have an issue. And if you do have an issue, it'll help you prevent any uh, possible uh, issues with, uh, with your customers. So that uh, pretty much does it for my presentation. Uh, thank you for uh, watching it. And I guess now we'll go to the, um, the panel discussion. Not not so fast. <laughs> that was awesome, Yasha. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. That was an excellent presentation, and uh, uh, and and not too overly technical, which uh, I know a lot of us Midwesterners uh, appreciate. Um, I hope you can stay with us uh, till the end of the webinar uh, to help the, all of us and the panel uh, answer any questions uh, that might uh, might come up. Uh, now, uh, I, I notice we don't have uh, hundreds of participants, but we do have uh, the next hour uh, to discuss, uh, to ask questions, get feedback about uh, uh, sweet wine production uh, by three, our three great uh, Midwest winemakers today. And I mean that. Uh, we've got three really super top-notch uh, Midwestern uh, winemakers, uh, uh, Zach from Iowa, uh, makes a lot of great wine and a, and a, and a lot of great sweet wine. Uh, and John Taylor, Chankaska, and, and Ryan uh, Prelwitz out at Vines and Rushes uh, in Wisconsin. All of these guys have a lot of experience uh, and a lot of practical knowledge. Um, uh, so thank, uh, thank you, uh, panel, for being with us today.
before we uh, start this discussion, I'll, I'll uh, give some brief introductions here. Uh, uh, John Taylor's career has taken several twists and turns uh, on the road to Minnesota. He's a native Californian, uh, grew up with wine as a part of everyday life, like a lot of, like a lot of us Californians. Uh, it wasn't until a, a birthday trip to Napa and a, and a really fine bottle of Napa Cabernet that he considered wine as a career. Uh, after falling in love with wine chemistry and changing his major, uh, John embarked on a number of different experiences during his undergraduate and early career, uh, interning with the uh, Edna Valley Vineyards in uh, San Luis Obispo County in California. Uh, John worked with Cool Climate Grapes for two years while finishing his uh, BS uh, in Enology and Viticulture from uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Uh, after graduation, he spent three years working with uh, the E&J Gallo uh, 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 folks. Uh, and a number of different facilities, uh, learning not only the art and science of wine, uh, but uh, logistics uh, and uh, production efficiency. Uh, he, he, he really wanted to be a, a winemaker, a hands-on winemaker. So uh, three years after uh, for Gallo, he was working, uh, uh, at making wines, uh, helping at uh, Ecluse Wines in Paso Robles. Uh, and then he worked with a, a whole bunch of different great uh, California winemakers, including Randall Graham, uh, from Bonnie Dune and Allison Crow and a bunch of others. Uh, anyway, uh, John uh, eventually uh, made his way to Minnesota in about 2017 uh, and started uh, at Chancaska Creek Winery in 2018. Uh, and Ode, I think you were going to introduce Zach. Yes. So now I'm going to introduce Zach, who is the winemaker for Ackerman and Fireside Winery in Marengo, Iowa. Fireside Winery is a family operation opened in 2006. In 2015, Ackerman Winery was acquired and the production was combined in one location. So the combined operation currently produces 16,000 cases annually and operates three store fronts in Marengo and Amana, Iowa. They focus on the production of wine from French American hybrid raised in their 20 acre vineyard and high quality fruit wines. And that's for real. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I've had some of Zach's uh, fruit wines, and they are wonderful, uh, wonderfully pure, wonderfully balanced, uh, and and they're all sweet. Uh, he makes a lot of sweet wine. That's why I wanted him here today. Mm -hmm. uh, last but not least, Ryan Prowitz is the owner and winemaker of Vines and Rushes Winery in uh, Ripon, Wisconsin. Uh, the winery, along with a five-acre vineyard, is located on the multi-generational Prowitz family farm. Uh, his background is in technology, marketing, and agriculture. Uh, he's helped establish the Vines and Rushes Winery as an icon of the region, and it is. Uh, Ryan was the founding president of the Wisconsin Grape Growers Association, uh, served as a president for seven years, and currently is president of the Wisconsin Winery Association. So, with this wonderful panel and all this practical experience and all these winemakers, I, I hope we might have some questions. So, before we start, probably the roundtable or sharing experiences, we do have one question for, from Patrick um, in the chat box. So, does the type of residual sugar, so either glucose, sucrose, or fructose, have an impact on the dangers of re fermentation after bottling? I think, Jasha, that's for sure. you. <laughs> um, so, I mean, all those sugars can be used by microbes. Um, Sucrose takes a little bit more effort for the microbes. They've got to take it in and convert it. They've got enzymes they release to invert it before it comes in. Um, so sucrose can be used, fructose can be used, glucose can be used. Glucose is the preferred one. So if you're using dextrose or something like that, you would be getting a, you would be making it a little bit easier. Uh, fructose is a little less uh, um, preferred as far as uh, energy source and you know, generally speaking, when you see in some stuck fermentation situations, there's oftentimes very low glucose and a presence of fructose uh, because it is a little bit harder for uh, for yeast to ferment. So, is using fructose a better option for sweet wines if you're trying to prevent refermentation? I don't know if it's really a strategy that's worth taking. Um, I think you know probably the, the preference would just be on uh, trying to prevent the refermentation at, at all costs, but. Um, but there is a preference as far as which ones they would prefer to use. Good, thank you. Um, so, 
in order to start on the discussion about challenges of sweet wines, we would like to have you three, uh, Zach, John, and Ryan, uh, to explain what type of sweet wines you produce, what are the issues you faced, and how to, you try to manage the issues you faced, and if you use sorbate or sorbic acid to help prevent refermentation, or if you just do filtration, or what is your other strategies that you use to use. So I don't know which one wants to start, but <laughs> feel free to unmute yourself and start. Let, let's start, let's go uh, alphabetically by last name. We'll start with Zach Bot. Good. Why wouldn't you? Uh, can you hear me? All right, so uh, I guess you guys explained who I am. We do make a ton of fruit wines and we make a ton of sweet wines. Um, I don't have a chemistry background per se, and I don't really know a lot of strategies, but I have what Les Ackerman did for years and years and what we've done, and we've had a lot of success. I won't say we've never had a problem with wine in the bottle, but we've had very, very few over the years, so we've been very fortunate. Um, I guess our strategy here starts first with sanitation. We're pretty hard about keeping everything clean because we know we want to have a clean, good wine. And especially with the fruit wines as we're making them, we need to keep our tanks full and clean and because we want to make the freshest tasting wine that we can make, especially on those fruit wines. So sanitation is very important. We do use sorbet on all of our sweet wines and I'll be perfectly honest, the person that Talked me into that is Merle Demarakari, who I still can't pronounce his name, but I spent a lot of time with when I got started here. And he just said, do it and don't ask questions about it, just do it. And I've been doing this since 2007 and it served me quite well. And so we continue to do that. Um, we do vary how much we do based on alcohol percentages. Some of our fruit wines, you know, can be closer to that 9% alcohol. So we will use a little less in there. And we do, um, do trials with everything to try to make sure we're not influencing the flavor on the fruit wines. We very rarely have any issue with um, the sorbet changing the flavor. Some of the white wines that we do some Brianna's and stuff like that. If we add a little too much sorbet, we will see some, you know, geranium or that kind of cotton candy smell. And so we'll back that down a little bit. Um, and then we cross flow everything and then we 0.45 filter everything. Um, that's just standard operating procedure around here. And we do make sure we use steam on our bottling line and um, before and after, and we do swab. I won't say we do it every time, but we do it most of the time to make sure we don't have anything growing on that line and knock on wood, we've had a lot of success. So that's sort of, you know, how we do it. I don't know what else you got. We do use a fair amount of fructose for back sweetening, not necessarily because, uh, it's better for fermentation, but we found that, especially on the fruit wines, we can get away with using a little less fructose um, and get a sweeter tasting wine for some of those wines. Um, we don't use fructose on everything, but we do use it on some. Um, but it, it not it'll it, if if you don't do it right, fructose will still referment. So we don't have to concern about that. So Zach, when you add sorbet, do you consider the alcohol content and the pH as Jasha was explaining? Yeah. Yes, yeah, we, I use, things? I still have my old book from early and I've got a big ass chart. I was just looking it up because I want to make sure and we take that little chart and, you know, most of, most of our white grape wines are in that 11 and a half to 12 and a half percent. So, you know, and pHs are generally below three, four. So we're usually in the, around a gram per gallon on those. Um, some of our fruit wines, like I said, and the mead that we make will get down below 10% alcohol and can have some pHs on some of those that are closer to three, four, three, five. So we'll go up to two grams on per gallon on some of those. Um, but like I said, especially if we're gonna at a gram per gallon, I'm pretty we've never really seen any flavor. Once we start talking about adding two grams per gallon, we'll do trials on all those to make sure we don't affect the flavor. Um, we don't really it doesn't bother people that cotton candy smell, but we don't really want it, especially on those fruit wines. We're trying to make those taste like the fruit, so we don't want to change those. At all. Thank you. I do have uh, just questions in the Q and A in the chat box. Uh, so one of the question is from Bill, and that's a mix between comment and question. 
So he bottled some Concord in July, which I thought was fully fermented. In September, when the batch was laying down in bottle, I had one bottle blow up, blow out a cork. When I opened another bottle from the batch, it was definitely dry and fizzy. Should I open them all and record? I mean, I don't know how big a batch this is. I'm going to be perfect last. We've only ever had this happen one time. It happened three or four years ago. Um, we had some filter problems and we just, we ditched the whole thing. But um, that was a pretty quick decision for us. Like, we don't want to have, I don't want to have a bottle of my wine sitting in somebody's shelf and blow up on them. Uh, we had some filter problems that we didn't catch and it just happened. But yeah, I, I would definitely, you know, if you want to try going through, maybe you just had a dirty bottle or something. I mean, that's possible. But if you've got two for sure, depending on how big the batch was, I, I, I'd open them up. Me. Yeah, they 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 say uh, sh should I open them at all and record? Of course, what he meant is is open them and recork. And I and I think that I I agree with you, Zach, that if it's a small batch, uh, if we're talking a couple cases or something, I don't know if this is a commercial or a home winemaker, um, but but just of course recorking is is not the answer. They, what you would have to do is take out the corks and then pour all the wine into a tank. Uh, what we call uh, debottling. Uh, if you've ever had to debottle a couple of pallets of wine, uh, it's a it's a painful exercise, but it can be done. Uh, but then you're going to, uh, as I say, gather all that up in a tank, uh, uh, and then re restabilize the wine, refilter it, uh, potentially uh, have to 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 reprotein stabilize it. Uh, uh, who knows what you'll have once you get it all out of the bottle? Uh, then you have to decide: Are you going to are you going to invest in all new bottles and new labels and new corks and new capsules? So uh, uh, debottling and rebottling can be uh, 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 painful and expensive. Uh, but anyway, uh, that that's my little addition to the conversation. And I don't know about the rest of the panel, but. Here at Chancaska, anything that's sweet, we do not use a cork with. I have uh, had issues with uh, corks actually being the source cause of a re-fermentation in the bottle. Um, so all of our sweet wines are in a screw cap for sure. And I'll just say, I agree with you 100%, but we're not quite that smart. So we still do some sweeter whites <laughs> and corks, um, mainly because, well, it's not important why, but I agree with the general sentiment. Yeah, screw caps are the way to go. Um, we have not had any bad luck, but yeah, I agree. Thank you. John, do you want to explain um, the type of sweet wines you produce if you had challenges? Sure. Um, here at Chancaska, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of um, similar things to what Zach's using. We are using um, a pad filter to break down, uh, to remove big solids prior to a cross flow unit at uh, 0.45 nominal. Um, and then we actually run a mobile bottling line business. Um, for other wineries in the upper Midwest, and uh, we have cartridge filters on there, both a pre-filter housing as well as a final filter housing. And so we'll go down to 0.45 absolute on that. Um, our line comes with a steam generator, so it is a sterile line. Um, I don't currently use uh, either Velcrin or Sorbet here at Chancaska. I have used both in the past at other wineries. Um, one thing my bio didn't say is I was the lab manager for micro, micro for a custom crush uh, facility that also did bottling. And they had about half a million cases go through that bottling line and uh, plating and uh, ATP swabs are definitely uh, in that environment, a useful tool to finding sources of contamination. Um, as far as grape concentrate, we don't use that. Um, most of our sugar is all due to arrested fermentations. Um, we do an apple wine. We also do, um, and of course I have a fly. Um, 
we also have uh, La Crescent and if we'll do a Riesling from Washington. And those are all sweet uh, ranging anywhere, our sweet wines anywhere from about 1% sugar up to three and a half, maybe 4%. Um, I do find that by arresting fermentations, uh, we keep more uh, fructose in those particular wines and the even at lower uh, percentage of residual sugar, they do end up tasting sweeter. And so we can get away with uh, back sweetening less on those wines. Um, uh, we have sent out for bottle sterility in the past as well for platings to monitor. Um, it's not something that we do for all lots now, but definitely some of our sweeter lots we will make sure that we have uh, solid wines in the bottle. Good, There's, thank you. Do, you. do you want to go on to, to let Ryan talk a bit or go on to the sure. next questions, Ode? Um, let's go for Ryan and then I will combine some questions. <laughs> All right, so at uh, Vines and Rushes, um, uh, we've been pretty good uh with our wine stability we had a couple of referments back in 2015 i think that were tied to um uh, a filter issue as well and um that uh but we've pretty much revamped our entire protocol since then um we do a cross flow filtration uh essentially the day before we bottle we're doing uh, uh all the additions on Bottling day, we do a cross flow uh, going through a, uh, so it's a 0.2 uh, nominal uh, scale. It's a VA filtration unit. Um, and that's uh, nominal 0.2. And then we go through a 0.45 absolute cartridge uh, into the uh, bottler direct. Uh, so that's all in one fell swoop. The, the filter, the cross flow filter itself is actually the pump going into the bottling line. And it's uh, sized uh, for the right speed, so we're running uh, four to five gallons a minute uh, generally through the bottling line. Um, we do 185 degree hot water uh, sanitation. Uh, we do use sorbates on anything with sugar. If it's less than a half a percent, we might not. Uh, and anything that with sugar, we're going to uh sterile filter with and cartridge filter uh, uh even uh, our dry reds uh we're going to probably just go through the cross flow on those uh and bypass the uh, membrane cartridge uh with our dry reds um let's see uh we don't adjust sorbate uh levels uh we're going with one gallon one gram per gallon on everything um and uh, adjusting uh, SO2 based on pH, obviously. And I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, we do make quite a few uh, sweet wines. We're 100% Wisconsin grown, um, but we do work with um, uh, you know, quite a few uh, of our cold climate varieties that uh, will generally ferment dry. Uh, in our uh, earlier days, we would actually uh, stop ferment on uh, maybe front neck re if we had the right yeast choice on it or something. Uh, and uh, capitalize a little bit during fermentation to get to the sweetness level we want with that. Uh, but it wasn't really worth the hassle. These days we're probably a little bit better equipped to halt a fermentation like that. Um, uh, a bulk tank chiller actually works really well uh, to dump, uh, you know, 500 gallons of something into a bulk tank and drop the temp really fast and add a bunch of SO2 to it would uh, would stop that fermentation real fast. But then you got to keep that cold and deal with all the uh, the complications of that, of timing of harvest and timing of bottling and not wanting that that to sit in, in tank for six months or something. Um, that's probably a 60-40 uh, sweeter and drier blend in our uh, wines lineup. Um, and it's probably 60-40 white to red as well. Uh, so most of what we do is uh, sweeter on the white end of the spectrum. Um, let's see. 
I think that's it for me. Patrick, uh, you've got a couple of questions. Uh, and Josh might be best at those, but the glycerin, uh, we will do um, some additions occasionally of uh, gum arabic, um, but that's not quite the same as glycerin, but it does add uh, a textural component to it. Uh, yes. Yeah. Glycerin would. Because Patrick was asking about the use of artificial artificial sweeteners for wines to avoid re-fermentation problems or glycerin addition. What do you think, Jasha? Oh, any of you. Artificial sweeteners are allowed, to be honest. I, I don't think they are. Um, I'm fairly confident in that. But, um, but yeah, as, um, you know, as Ryan mentioned, the gum arabic can really help with giving the perception of sweetness um, and also like paper offs and bitterness and things like that. So that can be a tool that you use to enhance sweetness, but to completely substitute something for sugar, um, it's I, I don't know that there's an option as far as complete substitution, at least not artificial um, options. Um, so, okay. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, both uh, or, or Zach in particular, uh, but maybe uh, uh, Ryan and Yasha as well. Uh, what about the the, the final timing? Of uh, sorbate uh, addition and then and then uh, a sulfide addition, uh, I seem to remember that you kind of want to do your sorbate addition within a day or two of the final filtration and and and, and getting ready to bottle. It's not something uh, that you'd want to use and then let it sit in the tank for a month or two until you're ready to bottle. Uh, can we talk a little bit about sorbate use timing? I don't want sorbate in the bottle. I, I I don't want sorbate in the tank for more than 48 hours uh, before it goes into bottle because then you get all of the issues that you're trying to avoid in the bottle with a wine with sorbate in it. Uh, so I yeah I, I don't we've never had a geranium taint issue uh, with sorbate uh, and I don't want to bring one around uh, and so that's why we keep the the levels uh, lower to begin with. Um, and uh, and yeah, there's maybe 48 hours. Uh, most of the time, it's uh, within 24 hours that we're bottling something after we've made those final additions. Same, same with you, Zach. Yeah, we might go to three days just because we don't quite we don't go from the cross flow to the bottling line. We usually mix up and cross flow and then bottle the next day. Actually, usually we cross flow over the weekend and bottle Monday or Tuesday, depending on health situations, but. Yeah. Um, so talking about that, yeah, we we try to make an addition, a filter, and bottle within probably three days most of the time. Um, there's another question in there since I'm talking that I know I can answer. There's talking about the size of your pre-filter housing and if it's four or five, what's the purpose? Um, the for us, it's cost. So the final 0.45 absolute filter is very expensive. So we use a 0.5 in front of it. We like to call it the bug catcher. Um, like I said, we are trying to keep our uh, tanks and everything really clean, but the fact of the matter is every once in a while something will get through and it just pr protects that absolute filter from getting fouled because they are, you know, whatever they are, 350 bucks a piece or something. So um, it's more of a protection thing than an actual filtration thing. And Zach, it should be noted too that you're not, so like with me, I'm using a cross flow as a pre-filter. Right. And you're not, you might be cross flowing on a Saturday and then bottling on a Monday. Right. So that's yeah. my pre filter. Is the yeah. Question. Yeah. No, we're, we're bottling it into another tank and then bottling it. You're going from your cross flow, right? Yeah. If I had that set up, yeah, that would be great. I don't think our cross flow is smart enough to do that, or I'm not smart enough to do it. So, um, this, yeah, that would is, be very slick. This is exactly the kind of discussion I wanted you. You gentlemen uh, to, to have there's yeah you ask you ask 10 winemakers a question you get 11 answers sometimes yeah no doubt um just looking through so do yeah, all of your wines get fermented to dry and then back sweden or do you stop fermentation early that's one of the questions so i would say i'm similar to what ryan was talking about we used to try to stop some um, and actually, you know, we used to do a fair amount of that. We just found that it, 
wasn't better enough. It's just so much easier for us to filter everything dry and make sure everything is stable and then back sweeten and filter. Um, we didn't see the benefits of stopping it when we can just back sweeten. Um, I don't know, not that one's better or worse, but it's easier and I feel more comfortable. You know, when something is dry, putting it in a tank for a couple months before I get time, you know, if I could bottle everything 2 months at or, you know, a month after harvest, it would be different, but that's not the way it works around here. John Ryan, any comment? Um, stopping fermentations, definitely you need the equipment to be able to do it. Um, so we're about to arrest a couple of fermentations this harvest in the next few days. We're monitoring our sugar levels as we do with all our ferments and we will start the uh, arrest process a little early ahead of our actual target. Um, and typically our target is going to be a little bit lower than uh, what we would take our final uh, sugar level to, uh, and we'll back sweeten just slightly if it needs it. Um, and the, the big one is to uh, nuke it with SO2 for sure to get it to uh, inhibit the fermentation process, chill it uh, to as pretty much as cold as the chiller will go. Um, a big, I'm a big fan of trying to uh, hit multiple stabilizations at the same time if you're doing an arrestment. So um, by potentially adding cream of tartar and or bentonite to get things to settle out, um, it's a great way to get an arrested fermentation, get heat stab stable and cold stabilize all in one foul swoop right after harvest. Um, if I'm doing this, I'm typically wanting to bottle within a two month, maybe a three month time frame. So pretty much anything that I'm arresting, I'm trying to get that into the bottle by the end of January. Um, and so one, it locks in freshness. Two, uh, I am able to um, manage the potential for referment, which is obviously an issue with the sweet wine hanging around the cellar. Um, and, and three, it just, it's one less thing for me to manage throughout the rest of the year. We're also a distillery and come February one, we are in full blown distillery mode, mashing grains. And so the last thing I want are a bunch of sweet wines hanging around the cellar at that point. Yeah. Ryan. Um, I had a thought here. What was it? Uh, I think it's important to note um, uh, your chilling uh, capacity as well. Um, you know, if you have, if you are marginally okay with your chilling capacity right now, uh, and, and, you know, uh, handling, you know, multiple different ferments, and then trying to throw on uh, dropping a, an active fermentation down to 30 or 35 degrees or something, uh, that's not going to be good on that chiller, and you might then uh, have to sacrifice the temp on a couple of other ferments. Um, uh, so if you have a, another way of dropping temp on uh, something like that, that's that would be great. We use a uh, an 800 gallon bulk milk tank, uh, kind of as our um, receiving tank from the press. Uh, so we uh, when we're pressing, uh, we'll. Uh, pump juice into there uh, and drop the temp into the uh, mid to upper 30s uh, right away before we rack into another tank for fermentation um, or for pre-settling prior to racking for fermentation rather. Uh, and so we could use that same tank to drop the temp uh, to halt the fermentation uh, instead of putting that same strain on our existing or our traditional tank chilling system. So I think that's definitely something to consider before you say, oh, I want to, I decided I want to halt fermentation. It's like, well, what can your equipment handle? I think that's a really big concern. Yeah, having the right infrastructure is absolutely key. If you don't have the chilling capacity, like Ryan is saying, I wouldn't even attempt it because then you're just going to stress the end of that fermentation out and you'll get a bunch of high, uh, hydrogen sulfide potentially or other issues and the last thing you want is to be troubleshooting a wine that you've got a bunch of delicate character that you're trying to preserve.
Does anybody has another question? Because you can unmute yourself if you have a question instead of using the chat box. There's the other uh, uh, question here from Patrick mm -hmm. uh, regarding the use, the addition of potassium sorbate. Does it uh, does it actually present a problem in the real world? Do customers actually reject wines uh, that taste of potassium sorbate or have a, a sorbate tone, as you can call it? Uh, and what does it taste like? The simple answer is it smells and and tastes like geranium flowers. Um, I don't think I've ever rejected a wine myself for having uh, a, a sorbet issue. Uh, I think maybe one time uh, I thought something had a had a real geranium uh, taint to it, and it, it made the wine not enjoyable. Um, any comments from the winemakers on that? I think I've only ever tasted one that I thought that's what it was and maybe it was something else. I don't think it is a big problem if, as long as you're not dumping tons and tons. Of, if you're staying in that one to two grams per gallon, I don't think yeah. you're any problems. It's just one of those I, things that somebody told me wants to be careful on, so I stay careful on it. I had a, a winemaker call me about six months ago and it, it, they could not have designed a more unstable product. Uh, the alcohol was a, a little bit over 8%, about eight and a quarter percent alcohol. They wanted about 10 or 12% residual sugar and the pH was already about 3.8. And, uh, and they had no means to sterile filter at all. And at that point, I, I, you know, it was like with that low of an alcohol, you have to use so much sorbet uh, that it, it may be above the, the human sensory threshold and I, I remember asking somebody, I may, it may have been you, Ode, or, or somebody I reached out to uh, 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 asking about sodium benzoate, which, of course, is, is what they use in, you know, to keep uh, soft drinks uh, from re-fermenting. When they keep Coca-Cola, uh, uh, if you ever looked at the ingredients in the Coca-Cola, you'll see, uh, uh, you'll see sodic acid and sodium benzoate sometimes. So uh, it's, it, it, I know people want to make a certain product. Uh, I mean, it sounds good, high RS and, and low alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. But boy, what a what a difficulty to try to stabilize that. And maybe that would be good just to be trained on the geranium taint because I know that's really difficult to pick up the smell that it is. So if you can purchase just the standard of this geranium taint, that's the best way to identify if your wine is being Refermenting and it's being providing this geranium taint. Um, just a suggestion. In my experience, the taint has a tendency to show itself the older a wine gets. So I would say if you are going to use sorbate, um, how much wine are you making and how much are you going to sell? And where is it going to sell? If it's going to sell in distribution and sit on a uh, liquor store shelf for four years, will you potentially have a geranium taint in your wine? Depending on your alcohol level and your sulfite level, that could potentially be an issue. Um, at Gallo, we would see it do during competitive tastings of products that were two or three years old, uh, the new product would not show it. The one-year-old product would not show it, but two or three year may show it. Um, so it's, it's something to keep in mind if you're gonna use sorbet, make sure that those wines are running out uh, quickly um, and that you're not gonna be sitting on a single bottling for potentially Four or five years. That's a good comment. Thank you, John. Uh, so we have another question for you, John, from Dorothy. So, with your cross flow going right into the bottling line, do you add to fight before the cross flow? I actually don't do that. Um, I actually cross flow before the day of bottling. I don't. I'm not cross flowing. Um, during the during the day of bottling, I think Ryan was right. Aren't you? Yeah, Ryan's Ryan. the one cross flowing into the bottling line. 
Yep, I'm the one doing that. Uh, so we're making all of our additions. Uh, uh, sometimes it's immediately before, but we'll do. Um, so we're going to start with a sulfide addition, uh, and then our sorbate addition, and then our sugar addition, and then zenith, uh, which is probably something Joshua should cover as well. Um, but the, those four products uh, for a sweet wine, uh, that's what's going in the bottle, or but that's what's going into the tank in that order. And anywhere from 48 hours to, yeah, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes sometimes before bottling starts, uh, we'll make that addition. Uh, and um, and then it's going through the cross flow, through the absolute membrane, directly into the bottling line. I was going to say, the going from cross flow through an absolute membrane, I think it's in the Midwest what we call belt and suspenders. Right. Which is fine. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's a 0 0.2 nominal uh, um, filter, uh, the cross flow is. Uh, would we be fine with just the cross flow? I don't know. Probably. Uh, I don't know that I want to find out if we wouldn't be fine. Um, if you ask the, the manufacturer and they say it's nominal, um, we can't guarantee it. Um, and so just an, out of an abundance of caution, we still cross slow and uh, absolute membrane. I would say that uh, a final filter of absolute 0.45 may seem expensive, but as far as insurance goes on a bottling, it's an awfully cheap peace of mind. Right, spot on. As, yeah, as, I, I as, agree wholeheartedly. As yeah. long as you can guarantee the the sanitation of the hose and the fitting uh, from from the uh, from the sterile filter all the way into the bottle. Sanitation over everything. It, 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 Yasha made a, a big point of that. Uh, most, in, in my experience too, most of the problems uh, weren't in the wine until the wine went through the bottling line. So getting that that bottling line, every tap, every fill head, uh, every gasket. Uh, 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 sterilized either with steam or with 185 degree water uh, is absolutely essential. Yeah. There's a question here. Yeah. Uh, um, about the preferred way to back sweeten. Whether you guys does anybody prefer concentrate or sucrose or one over the other? I've used both for different reasons. I've also used both. Um, if I'm using concentrate, I'm back sweetening before my cross flow. Um, I want that concentrate to go through the cross flow. And then um, the one thing I'm hesitant to use concentrate with um, is it can screw up your cold stability. Um, so I'm, I'm very hesitant to use concentrate typically. Um, right now, if I am back sweetening, I'm using granulated sucrose. Um, it's cheap. It's readily available. Hell, my, my kitchen actually orders it for me because I get a better price than I do. So, um, as far as I'm concerned, it's just easy. And then we also do traditional method champenois, um, having granulated sugar on hand to make sparkling wines is the only thing that I would make sparkling wines with. So. Yeah, we use pretty... uh, granulated sugar as well, uh, granulated suc sucrose. We buy from a bakery supplier, a uh, bakery supply company. It's yeah, it's easy and fast. We order it, and two days later, it shows on a semi. Uh, it's a company forty five minutes away, so it's yeah, it's cheap, uh, cheap and easy and consistent. So I don't need to worry about what are we using with this or that. Or, you know, it's just simplicity is a wonderful thing. We're the same granulated. It's you can, yeah, you don't have to worry about how it stores. It's fine. You can get it quickly. It's cheap. And in it's an easy. emergency, you can hit Walmart. Yeah. Or Costco or Sam's or yeah. Thank you. Anybody has another question? We still have time. I want to ask Yasha how I was, uh, over the last few years, you started to hear more and more about Titusan. 
and uh, are more and more, you know, every time something new comes out, there's a few early adapters and everybody else sort of wants to wait a few years to see how the early experiments or the early adapters do. Uh, are, are sales of uh, Kytosan uh, increasing? Or are you noticing more people using it? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, it's definitely increasing over time. Uh, winemakers are finding it um, an indispensable tool for, you know, as like an insurance essentially during harvest and throughout aging. So um, basically when a, when a problem emerges in a wine, let's say during harvest, you're finding that you have an increase in VA or that you notice that the fruit quality might uh, be less than what you prefer. If there's any rot or anything like that, uh, you can have um, Kaizen or and our com company say um, products that micro in hand. And what you can do is basically um, treat a juice or treat a wine to remove the spoilage of microorganisms. Uh, so it's kind of like an on or off switch for microbes. When you when you have a uh, kaizen in suspension, it's doing its job, and you turn the switch off, it settles off, and then you can rack and you're basically need to remove the spoiled microorganism. So and it's not pH dependent, so if you have high pH situations, it works well. Um, and yeah, so we have a lot of winemakers that are making low SO2 wines or wines that uh, they just want to have a little bit of added protection, and it's it's working quite well for them. So. It is, gain, it is gaining uh, use in the industry over time. And there's just a question here uh, from my good friend Polly Perkins. Uh, she wants to hear about Zenith, uh, in Artis's uh, stabilization product. Sure. Uh, so Zenith is a molecule that we developed. Um, our parent company, in Artis, in Italy developed the. Um, Potassium polyaspartate, which is the ingredient of Zenith. Zenith is our cold stabilization line. Uh, so the way Zenith works is basically it's uh, added to wine just before bottling um, to stabilize tartrates. Uh, and it does so by binding to potassium and preventing potassium uh, from interacting with tartrates. So you get to basically avoid the whole situation of cold stabilization in terms of chilling the tank down the tank out, racking off tartrates, all that uh, good stuff. So um, there are some considerations with using it. You have to have a protein stable uh, wine, so you can't have a lot of unstable proteins in your wine when you use it. Uh, but uh, and then you need to add it uh, to a clear wine, a wine that doesn't have a lot of turbidity. Uh, but that's another tool that is gaining a lot of traction for winemakers. Actually, finding that the quality of the wines that um, from the use of Zenith is is higher in many cases, because when you chill wines down, you sometimes have the um, the situation where you might absorb more oxygen. Solubility of oxygen goes up as the wine uh, temperature decreases. So if you don't have good control over oxidation during that process, you can actually uh, absorb a lot of oxygen when the wine is cold, and then when the wine temperature warms up, let's say a bottling or whatever, uh, that oxygen basically gets uh, goes to deteriorate aromas and things like that. So by avoiding that situation, you can sometimes uh, you know have higher quality wines. And then in some cases too, particularly in areas like California where they're trying to preserve natural acidity, um, not having to go through uh, tartrate stabilization and preserving natural acidity is important. Uh, so the Zenith allows them to do that as well. Uh, but it's a it's a great product. We're really excited about it, and winemakers are excited about it as well. So we have a lot more information on our on our YouTube channel if you're interested in learning more. Um, another couple of comments on just winemaking in general uh, tips that along the uh, the process, I guess um, we we do make a Scottzyme KS uh, edition. Uh, which is an enzyme, you send it's their kitchen sink enzyme, so to speak, uh, from Scott Labs. Uh, we'll make that on all of our wines um, uh, post fermentation. Um, and we found that that dramatically decreases the amount of uh, bentonite that we have to use to reach heat stability. Uh, and then we're using uh, the Proteo Test, uh, which is an Anardis product as well. 
to test heat stability uh, essentially with a um, uh, nephilotometer uh, the, um, uh, to test up NTUs. Um, uh, and that will determine where we're at for bentonite addition, um, you know, midway through winemaking. And uh, if we are doing cold stabilization, uh, it's generally because we want to drop out some acid, not because we have to to stabilize the wine, uh, which is where zenith comes in. That's going to stabilize for us. Uh, so most of the time, we're not doing a cold stabilization process. It's just going to be a zenith addition uh, pre bottling. Can you explain what type of varieties you use Zenit with, Ryan? Uh, we're using it on everything as a standard protocol with all, all wines. Unless for some reason we've actually done the cold stabilization process uh, prior to. Uh, for sweet wines, uh, we generally aren't. We're just going to uh, tweak that acidity level more with sugar uh, or blending with something else. Uh, rather than doing um, the cold stabilization. Um, but that comes down to a personal preference, uh, you know, with winemakers is, you know, if they want to trust the addition of a product or try to have that, uh, that wine stabilized pre-bottling. That's an amazing, uh, what, what wonderful flexibility uh, that gives a winemaker, especially small batch winemaking uh, here in the Midwest, where maybe they don't have the greatest chilling capacity uh, or, or they're making the wine sweet, as you say, so they're, they're not really worried about dropping the acidity. They're going to balance out that out with sweetening anyway uh, and save a lot of electricity, too. I, I, I think uh, some, some winemakers who have big chillers and have the large jacketed tanks, uh, sometimes they're not the same guy or girl uh, paying the electricity bill. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, regular cold contact chilling uses a lot of electricity. Uh, so having a product uh, that can uh, forego that necessity, uh, that's wonderful. I'm going to echo Ryan's sentiments on enzyme treatments, particularly with our cold climate varieties. Um, since we are needing to filter them to get uh, sweeter wines stable, ready for bottle, um, I have definitely seen uh, cold climate whites and pinks have issues with filtration and um, the product he mentioned KS enzyme is a great resource and tool to make uh, filtrations happen uh, fruit wines as well I know um, Zach can probably attest to that that uh, that they can be a bear as well to filter so uh, enzyme treatment prior to filtering is uh, anything uh, predominant cold climate for us also gets an enzyme treatment. And there actually is another new product from Scott called Spectrum. Uh, it's maybe a year or two old, uh, which is one enzyme step beyond KS. So more than the KS when you, all, when you throw the fridge at it, I guess, or something. <laughs> Uh, and we have used that on, uh, we did a custom Aronia wine batch for somebody, and uh, that is a nightmare to filter, uh, <laughs> apparently. And Zach, do you have any tips for me on that one? I, I know we do. So the fruits get pack at, get pack five at the crusher on everything across the board. And then we will use uh, that KS on pretty much all of our fruit wines sometime before about, you know, Midway through, depending on how things are going, fruit wines need lots of enzymes to get them filtered, especially the cross flow and especially wines that are sweet. We are, I should have mentioned, we do sweeten before we cross flow because we want that finished wine to go through the cross flow. And some of the wines that we're talking about up close to 10 residual sugar, we have a hard time getting through the cross flow. Just there's just a lot of stuff going on. Um, so those enzymes make a hell of a difference. Cold filtrations don't like to flow either, so yeah, um, it's it's a bear. And so the the cleaner you can make the wine going through your filtration, the better. And it it just makes your saves you time, saves you effort, saves you swear words in the cellar. It's all it's all good stuff. Yeah, we just ordered some of that zenith. We haven't tried it in the past, but I, when I talked to Ryan a few weeks ago, we did some research on it and. 
like Drew was saying, not just the energy cost, but just the time sink of, you know, having something cold for two weeks and then filtering it off and, you know, the oxygenation is definitely a big thing, especially even if you're, you know, mixing that wine with, you know, tartar or uh, cream of tartar to try to do it, you're throwing a ton of oxygen in cold wine. And if we can get away from that, we're gonna, we're gonna try it and we'll see how it goes. That's, that's a very good point. We, we, we often think about when you crash, uh, crash a uh, temperature crash of wine down to 30 degrees or something, you're sort of putting it in suspended animation. Uh, but we sometimes forget that the colder the wine is, the faster it can absorb oxygen. Uh, so that's another a, a very good point, Zach. Uh, keeping a wine cold like that for two weeks, uh, you're opening the door to, to some rapid oxidation, possibly. Yep. Well, there's a lot to think about. No question about it. Mm -hmm. So Arlene was just asking about the type of Zenit to use for whites and for reds. So is it Zenit you? Uno for whites and Zenit Cordo for reds? If you follow the literature, yeah, Zenith Uno for uh, whites, Zenith Color for reds. Uh, we just use Zenith Uno on everything. Uh, I think uh, the Zenith Color is more, you're talking about uh, uh, wines where you have more uh, color stability issues, uh, which is something I've never had an issue with, uh, with these cold climate varietals. Uh, and so the advantage of, uh, color, uh, over Uno, I, maybe it's there for us. Maybe there's, you know, quantitative data that says so, but I, I just don't necessarily think it's a big deal. Uh, and it's easier just to buy one product and have one product on hand in, in my situation. Yeah, so that's absolutely correct. You can use, uh, Zenith Uno on whites or reds. Um, Zenith color is, is intended for highly colored reds that have unstable color. Um, and if you don't have that problem, then you can definitely just use Zenith Uno for that purpose. Thank you. One uh, research topic I'd like to see some uh, more information on is uh, cinnamic acid uh, in some of our cold climate uh, red varietals, specifically Petit Pearl and uh, Sabravois, um, that gives a, off a really earthy component to it. Uh, and so some of the enzymes that uh, are interacting with those earthy components and releasing them as, uh, as volatiles, uh, I think might be uh, creating some of the earthy associations that we have with some of those wines. So we actually use, uh, instead of a PEC 5L uh, at Crush, uh, with some of these varieties, we're actually using Sin Free as an enzyme uh, at Crush instead. Uh, so something to throw out there for the research minds on the call. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, yeah, so what did you observe as a difference between the two type of enzymes? Uh, significant benefit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you it's didn't hard have the earthy aroma with the other enzyme you use instead of pic 5 l Right. Yep. Sin free, uh, C I N N free is another Scott Labs enzyme uh, versus pec 5 l which is another one. Uh, and so yeah, it, it uh, eliminated some of those uh, earthy components, uh, but it could be a vintage variation as well. Uh, I think this is our second year doing it, so we'll know a little bit more. Okay. Thanks. Good tip. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody else have a comment, a question? Yeah, I think I think that's actually a really interesting point um, on the cinnamic acids, and I'd be interested to learn more about uh, the origins of the cinnamic acids. If it's coming from the skins, or if it's coming from just in the juice, or or the pulp, because I think certainly there could be some ways to uh, get more of it out of the fruit if. Um, if enzymes are doing the work. So I will do some, I'll do some research on that. So thanks for the topic. I'm yeah, available if you need to. There's a, there's an article somewhere that I'll try and dig up, Yasha, uh, that uh, covers some of the details on that. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I'm currently using PEG5L five, five right at crushing on market uh, to extract more phenolic compounds. And that's mainly on uh, tannin, but I would be looking at all the phenolic compounds. So I would be looking at the hydroxycinamic acid. I don't have another enzyme really to compare, but that's good to know. 
Uh, and I don't know that Marquette, there's an issue with that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, quantifying the the uh, amount of cinnamic acid in some of these varietals would probably be a really good starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably have a GCMS on hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there we go. That's a good starting yeah. point. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they we have, also have they, Petit Pearl. So, yes. Nice. Mm -hmm. they, they have all that. I don't. I just got a lot of great breeding. And, and a lot of great have friends. So there you go. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right. We think we're in the last few minutes here. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to excuse myself and go do about a dozen punch downs uh, before okay. I go home. I want to uh, thank uh, all of you for participating. I, I know you're all right in the thick of it, uh, but we had uh, over 35 participants uh, mm -hmm. at the peak and uh, thank each of you. Uh, uh, for coming, it, it's uh, I've, I've been able to visit each of you at your wineries. Uh, I haven't seen Zach for about five years, but it's good to. Uh, it's, it's fine that I haven't heard from him. He's been he's been busy making a lot of great wines, and and winning a lot of great awards uh, as well. Uh, so good to see you, Zach, and uh, uh, say hi to Cassie and your folks, and uh, and John. We'll see you sometime soon, I imagine. And uh, I think Ode is going to, uh, I'll jump in and just remind uh, everybody, we we really do uh, appreciate your responses to the surveys. Uh, this uh, helps us justify uh, the effort, the time we spent putting this together. Uh, we do read uh, every uh, survey comment uh, and take them to heart. And uh, uh, with that, I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Watrilo, uh end our session. Thanks, Drew. You explained everything, almost everything. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much for your participation, all of you. Zach, Ryan, John, thank you so much to be part of that webinar roundtable uh, style of uh, today. And so we hope this web webinar was really helpful for you, providing new knowledge to you uh, that would be hopefully helpful for this year, um, if it's not too late. Uh, so just please send us um, an email if you have any questions, but also uh, please take a few minutes uh, to complete the survey. It's going to only take two, three minutes to complete the survey, but that's really to get uh, your feedback and how we can improve our um, webinar series to provide you more knowledge, more tools for your winemaking. Um, and also, so before closing this webinar, I would like um, to keep you posted for the future research and winemaking webinar series. Uh, so we're going to have the next one next month on bentonite treatments, November 2nd. And the last one of the year is going to be in December. So maybe the 7th, maybe we will discuss about the, the read date, but that's going to be about analogical tannin. So stay tuned for the other webinar. And once again, if you don't have any more questions, thank you very much. And Jasha, thank you so much for your great presentation at the beginning of this webinar. That was all perfect. Yes, thank you. Absolutely, Yasha, very, very much. Uh, you folks of an artist have been very, very helpful uh, over the years. We really appreciate it. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Bye, John. Au revoir. Bonne journée.